Amen. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. What a wonderful prelude. We've come together this morning out of a fear-filled world to worship the God of all comfort, the one who strengthens and fortifies us to stand firm during days of confusion and chaos. And so we seek to be strengthened by our King, by His Word. So hear now the Word of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 through 17. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of His hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord, or what man shows Him His counsel? Whom did he consult? Who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. This is the word of the Lord, and we will respond by singing his praises. Would you stand as we sing? praise and adore our high and lofty Creator God through prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord, our everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth, we lift our voices to praise You. You are not like us. You do not tire. You do not grow weary. You do not faint. And so we come to You now to strengthen our spirits. You are the source of our comfort 
And so we pray, comfort, comfort your people. You have spoken tenderly to us when you told us that our warfare with you is ended. Our sins have been forgiven in Christ. So may we rest in this truth now and forevermore we pray. Amen. When Isaiah saw the king high and lifted up upon the throne, Isaiah also saw his own personal sinfulness. And he recognized that he could do nothing about it. But the king alone could save him. Our brother the Apostle John reminds us in his first letter that everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he, that is Christ, appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. That's 1 John 3, 4 and 5. As we're reminded each week, each day even, that we, the saints of Christ, still practice lawlessness. We still sin, and we still damage the fellowship that we have with our Savior. But we look now to the rock of our cleansing. Would you remain seated as we sing our hymn of confession, Rock of Ages. cling to the rock from which we are hewn, the rock of ages that has alone saved us. That means in the good times and in the bad, we must cling to Christ alone. Psalm 46, in part, tells us that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. So come, Behold the works of the Lord, how He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted above the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We sing now of our rock and our fortress and that great hymn, the battle hymn of the Reformation, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Would you stand as we sing?
and you may be seated. As the choir is being seated, let me tell you that if you've ever thought about joining the choir, now's a wonderful time to do that. Have a binder and not let your papers fly away. Even as the choir is looking forward to Laramie's coming on October 23rd, they have not stopped rehearsing, and more importantly, they have not stopped doing a critically important job, which is to help us as a congregation to fulfill God's command. When God tells us in the book of Colossians to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in our hearts to God. The choir is so important to doing just that each and every week, helping us obey Scripture. And Lord willing, they will be uh, singing for you again, encouraging you in song next Sunday. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you do not have a Bible uh, with you, there's one provided for you there in the pew in front of you. So I encourage you to find your place in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 1856, the now famous preacher, 22-year-old Charles Spurgeon, was being used by God to do a remarkable work there in the city of London. The young husband with infant twin sons back at home, every week when he looked out, he saw a crowd overflowing there as he stood to preach in the new Park Street Chapel. And the church soon decided that uh, the place was so full they needed to rent out public places so that they could renovate their facilities and have more room for more people. And on October 19th, 1856, over 10,000 people gathered together in the Surrey Gardens Music Hall there in London to hear God's Word proclaimed. But no sooner had the service begun than tragedy struck. Cries from the back soon begin to break out. Fire! The balconies are falling. The galleries are giving way. And in that chaos that followed as 10,000 people tried to exit the building all at once, unspeakable tragedy unyielded itself, unfolded uh, before the eyes of the young Spurgeon. He watched as people trampled one another as they were trying to safely make an exit. When it was all said and done, seven people had died. An even larger number of people were in critical condition, uh, with 28 of them in critical condition, many more even injured. And the sorrow was almost too much for the young preacher. He almost never preached again. For days he was inconsolable. He couldn't stop weeping. He had watched the panic unfold before his very eyes as he tried to give the direction from the platform. He felt the weight of it all on his shoulders. But even worse... The newspapers were blaming him for all that had happened. How could he dare to preach to that many people at one time? What an ego. What pride. That's what they were saying. But here's what's worst of all. There was no fire. It was all a lie. They were never quite sure where that lie came from. The satanic spread of false statements led to an almost incalculable damage. The church was rocked. And lives were lost. And people were wounded, all because of a lie. Well, word has reached Paul that there's a lie spreading in the church at Thessalonica. It was rocking the church. It was causing almost incalculable damage. People are being wounded. And he wasn't quite sure where the lie was coming from. But Paul writes to his beloved church, and to us as well, that he might have clarity, that we might have clarity in times of confusion and comfort in times of chaos. So if you found your place in God's Word in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship 
so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Brothers and sisters, these startling words are God's Word. And the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. You may be seated as I pray. O oh Lord, may we delight in Your Word. Would You teach us Your ways? May we meditate on Your precepts. May we fix our eyes on Your ways. Open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. We pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul gets to the point. One of the main reasons that he's writing this letter, and it's a subject that we often stay away from. It's the future. It's our doctrine of the, the end times, of last things. Back in his first letter, Paul had written much about the future. He had written about what we call the rapture in chapter 4, how Jesus Christ will deliver us from the wrath that is to come. And he wrote about that time of great tribulation on earth, also known as the day of the Lord, written about in chapter 5 of his first letter. You see, Paul wasn't embarrassed to speak about the future to young Christians, young believers. He openly taught them about the end times. And we might think that they had a lot of questions because Paul's teaching was perhaps a bit complicated, and so they had questions about what he was saying. Well, there is great confusion in Thessalonica, as this second letter reveals, but it's not because Paul's teaching was unclear, but it's because false teachers came in behind Paul and taught the young church false doctrine. Look there in verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Based on these first two verses, the, the first step that we must take in finding clarity in times of confusion is don't be shaken. Don't be shaken. Like a tree shaking in the wind... The Thessalonian Christians have been shaken in their mind's understanding of what Paul has previously taught them. Paul gave them a healthy, biblical understanding of the end times and of the future, but a wolf has crept into the church and is preying upon the health of the spiritual flock. Word had gotten back to Paul that someone had creeped in and yelled fire in the theology of the church, and they're being trampled upon by fear. They're in a constant state of anxiety because somebody has told them that the day of the Lord has already come. And Paul's not entirely clear about where this teaching came from. Is it from someone claiming to have a prophetic word or a spirit, as he says there in verse 2? Or did someone preach a sermon, a spoken word that led to the confusion? Perhaps even worse, someone has sent a letter that appears to be from Paul himself and is teaching the exact opposite of what Paul had taught the Thessalonian church. Paul taught them that Christ would rescue them from the wrath that is to come. And now someone is writing in Paul's name that the day of the Lord, the wrath, has already come. Well, why would this upset them? Perhaps we need to remind ourselves of what the day of the Lord is. The Old Testament prophets spoke often about a coming day of the Lord. It'll be a day of wrath, a day of doom. Now to be sure, Jesus told us that all believers will have difficulties in this life. We'll have tribulations in this life. We'll have suffering in this life. We, we understand that. We experience that every day. 
But all of the normal sufferings and tribulations of this life are nothing in comparison to the great coming day of God Almighty. The day when His wrath will be poured out on this earth in a way unlike we've ever seen before. But Paul told the Thessalonians in his first letter that God has not destined us for the day of wrath. He praised them in that first letter for their faith in Christ and their steadfast hope in Jesus Christ who delivers us from the wrath to come. And Paul wrote about that hope that they had back in chapter 4 of the first letter, saying that all who are in Christ when the Lord appears in the clouds will be caught up together with Him in the clouds, and so we will always be with the Lord. Now we commonly call this the rapture, and Christians disagree about the timing of this event, but what we can't disagree about is that the word appears in the text. The Greek word harpazo, the, the snatching away, the rapture, whatever you want to call it, it's there in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we've got to figure out when it's going to happen. But as you remember, Paul wrote all of those things about the future in his first letter. He wrote it for their comfort. For those of you who were with us during our study of 1 Thessalonians, do you remember how often Paul said, comfort one another with these words? He said it many times in the first letter. But now someone is sowing confusion rather than comfort there in the church. Someone is spreading chaos rather than clarity. And so the doctrine of the future, our Christian understanding of the last days, which ought to give us comfort, it ought to give us confidence in Christ, it was actually sparking fear and anxiety there in the Thessalonian church. Maybe you can understand that. Perhaps even just a mention of the end times gets your blood pressure up a little bit. Maybe the whole discussion makes you just a little bit nervous. There are some Christians who, who heard the Bible taught in a discouraging way, perhaps even back when they were a child, and it's really uh, caused them to always approach the discussion of the end times with a little bit of fear and trepidation. Now they don't want to discuss it as adults. Well, to our children who are here this morning, I want you to know that the future should not scare you, and your pastor is not here to scare you. And for the adults who are here who may not want to discuss the future very much, the future should not scare you, and your pastor is not here to scare you. Yes, there will be dark, difficult days ahead. Go read 2 Timothy chapter 3. But our focus is to be on the King who is coming, not on the chaos and on the confusion of this world. And so the first step that we must take in finding comfort and clarity is simply not be shaken. Don't be shaken. Well, that's easier said than done. Can we all agree with that? So Paul keeps going. He gives us more. Don't be shaken, verses 1 and 2, but also verses 3 and 4, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. You see, being shaken and stirred up into an anxious state, that's, that's bad enough. But to be deceived about the day of the Lord, that's even worse. Worse, to be duped and misled into believing that the day of the Lord has actually already taken place, that it's actually already come, that would be far worse. And so Paul exhorts them, don't be deceived. Look at verse 3 and following. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Now the Thessalonians should not be deceived because there's at least two events that must take place before the coming day of the Lord. And Paul's going to show them that these things haven't taken place yet, so therefore they shouldn't be upset. They shouldn't be anxious. He says the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. Well, what is the rebellion? Or the apostasy? Or the falling away, as the King James expresses it? Paul is saying there will be an intentional abandoning of the faith that was once professed. There will be a great falling away from the day of the Lord. Well, what is this falling away going to look like? Well, it hasn't happened yet, so we don't exactly know. You can look all throughout church history, and I can show you through the graveyards of church history are littered with the bones of those who fell away from the faith that they once professed. They once proclaimed the true gospel of Jesus Christ, but they fell away from the gospel that they once held dear. The history of the entire Roman Catholic Church could be labeled falling away. Entire denominations have fallen away from the faith that they once preached and they once proclaimed. 
It's far too common now to hear Christian celebrities tell their deconversion story, which is a complete abandonment of the faith once for all delivered to the saints. They've become apostates and they've fallen away from the faith. But again, the Bible tells us that this will happen all throughout the history of the church. There will be many people who have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. Again, 2 Timothy. But Paul is saying here that the day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, not just a rebellion. He's looking to a specific event in the future, the falling away, the apostasy. Unless that comes first, not just any falling away, not just any old apostasy, there's a particular specific rebellion that's coming in the future. And it seems to be connected with this man of lawlessness. This man of lawlessness. So don't be deceived, because the day of the Lord will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of sin, the man, the son of perdition. He's called lots of names in the Bible, but you most likely probably refer to him often as the Antichrist. The Antichrist. And we get that language from the Apostle John. That's the language that John uses in his letters and in the book of Revelation. But Paul never calls him the Antichrist. He calls this the man of lawlessness, the man of sin. John warned us that even as the Antichrist is coming, there are many Antichrists already here. And in the same way, Paul warned us that there are many evil, lawless, sinful people. But he said there's coming a day when one particular, specific, real human being, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, will be revealed or unveiled. And when he's revealed... He will oppose and exalt, keep going in the verse, He will oppose and exalt Himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that He takes His seat in the temple of God, proclaiming Himself to be God. My goodness, what does this mean? Well, Jesus tells us that to understand this, we need to go look at the book of Daniel. Jesus said in His famous sermon in Matthew 24 that we need to look back at the book of Daniel. And some of you are studying Daniel in Sunday school. And I asked your teacher right before we came up here where you were at in the book of Daniel. And you were at a prime spot to ask him all of the questions that I leave unanswered in the sermon. All right? So if you don't have a Sunday school home, George's class is the place you want to be the next few Sundays because he's going to help you with so many things that I'm not going to have time to answer this morning. But Daniel prophesied about this a long time ago. And according to Daniel, this world leader who's coming, he will demand ultimate allegiance as if he is God above all else. This satanic antichrist, he will desecrate the holy temple of God. That's what Daniel tells us. Do you have more questions about all of this? I certainly do. But we dare not begin to examine the individual leaves on the tree before we see the big forest, the portrait that Paul is painting for us. Remember the big idea, what he's trying to tell us. We can have clarity even in times of confusion. And even as someone has already spread the false teaching that the day of the Lord has already come, the Thessalonians can have confidence that it has not in fact come because the rebellion has not happened yet and the man of lawlessness has not yet come. That's the resounding melody of this passage, even as there's definitely some intricate harmony in the verses before us. But it is still possible to have clarity by not being shaken, not being deceived, and thirdly, by not forgetting. Not forgetting. Look at verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? You see, the Thessalonians already had all they needed to stand firm against false teaching. Paul had already taught them everything they needed to know. They didn't have to be deceived. They didn't have to be shaken. In fact, Paul is a bit shocked that they've so easily fallen prey to this false teacher. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Now in verse 6, Paul starts reminding them of some of the things that he taught them when he was there with them in person. Things that should have fortified them against these peddlers of false doctrine. But here's the catch. They know what Paul's referring to. 
because they were there when he taught them and we were not. We only have the letter. So it makes things a little difficult to follow as if they haven't already been difficult enough. Look at verse 6. Paul writes, And you know what is restraining him so that he may be revealed in his time. You see, something is restraining this man of lawlessness, this man of sin, from being revealed too early. Something is holding him back from deceiving all the people that he wants to deceive. But actually, as we keep going, we understand it's not just something is restraining him, but it is someone is restraining the man of lawlessness. Keep going in verse 7. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Even as this man of lawlessness has not yet been revealed, the mystery of lawlessness is at work all around us. We see this every day. Sin and lawlessness are at work all around us every day. But it's not as much as it could be if the restrainer were not holding back this man of lawlessness. But we keep going in the verse it says, only he who now restrains it will do so until he's out of the way. You see, there's not some magical force or power that's restraining the man of lawlessness from doing his evil deceit now. No, it's a, it's a person. He who now restrains the man of lawlessness. And I believe that it's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. You see, the Spirit is busy at work keeping, restraining the man of lawlessness, the man of sin, keeping him until that day, even as sin and lawlessness abound all around us this day. Now, why is that? Let's think about it. Why is that? So that the man of lawlessness will only be revealed at the right time. At the right time. Think back over Jesus' earthly ministry. How many times there were opportunities for the table of events to have been sped up a little bit? Times that people wanted to proclaim Jesus as Messiah, and He said, no, keep it to yourself. And there were times that people wanted to come and take Jesus by force and make Him king by force. And there were other times when they didn't like what He had to say, and they sought to push him off of a cliff and destroy him, and even then he just slipped through the crowds. Why? Because his time had not yet come. You see that all throughout the Gospels, that Jesus reminds us that his time had not come, which meant there was a time when he would be revealed, a time when he would be crucified. But make no mistake, neither crucifixion nor coronation were allowed until the appointed hour because the time had not yet come. Nothing will interrupt the king's timetable. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. And in the fullness of time, the Spirit will cease to restrain this man of lawlessness. But make no mistake, it's not the man of sin's timetable that matters. It's all according to the plans of the king. Well, what is this king going to do when the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, is revealed? What will the true Christ do to that cheap imposter, the Antichrist? Well, you sang about it earlier. One little word shall fail him. Look at verse 8. Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. You see, we can have clarity in times of confusion. We will not be shaken. We will not be deceived. We will not forget that the prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. Why? Because his doom is sure. One little word will fail him. We saw this just a few weeks ago in Revelation 19. The Open Bible Sunday School class studied that passage this very morning. Christ will return on a white horse and with the blood of His enemies splattered about on His robe, but there's not going to be an actual battle because with one breath from His mouth, one word from the King's mouth, it is finished. The man of lawlessness will be defeated. The one that the world has looked to for peace and security will be unable to save himself. The one who lifts himself up above all earthly authorities and declares himself to be God will actually be brought low by the one who is God. The one who seemed to hold the answer to everything will be brought to nothing. Did you hear that in Isaiah 40 at the beginning of the service? 
The nations are like the drop of a bucket. They're like dust on the scale. The nations are like nothing before God. They're like less than nothing. How can you have less than nothing? Well, the nations, the enemies of God, are less than nothing to God. And the one who seeks to deceive the nations, this man of lawlessness, will be brought to nothing by the appearance of Christ's coming. Brothers and sisters, if Christ's victory is sure, if He defeats His enemies with the word of His mouth, then why are we so afraid? Why do we spend so much time trying to understand this man of lawlessness rather than focusing on the man of sorrows, the one who has made it possible for us to have victory over death in this life? Why do we get so afraid of the, of the movement and the saber rattling of nations, the nations that are nothing before our great God? You see, when we focus on Christ and the victory of His coming, then we don't have to be shaken. We won't be deceived. We won't forget the truth that we already know. We don't have to know every detail of the end times because we know everything that God wants us to know. And this gives us a good moment to, to pause and to think about how we read our Bibles. So often we come to our Bibles asking the questions that God is not trying to answer. There's a lot of questions that we have about this passage. And we could take lots of time and try to piece the parts of Scripture together and try to get a pretty good, educated guess about what Paul is referring to here in this passage. We could, we could do a whole sermon about uh, the Antichrist and, and what the Bible says about that as a whole. But Paul is building off of his teaching while he was there in Thessalonica, and we weren't there for that. So we don't know what he told them, everything he told them about the restrainer. We don't know everything that he told them about the man of lawlessness and the falling away. Did he give them a timeline? A chart? Maybe an alliterated outline? I'm convinced that when the Thessalonian church received this letter, they knew exactly what he was talking about. But we don't. Now we need to study the Scriptures. We need to seek to understand all that we can glean from this passage, as much as we can understand about the future. But we don't need to spend so much time fixated on the Antichrist to the neglect of actually studying Christ. We need to be reminded of who Christ is. You see, Paul wasn't trying to give them a chart. He was trying to give them comfort. And Paul wasn't trying to be a psychic with a crystal ball. He was shepherding the saints. And we shouldn't feel at a disadvantage because we can't fill in all the gaps in the Thessalonian conversation because God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness right here in His Word. And in fact, the only way that we can avoid being shaken, the only way that we can avoid being deceived, the only way that we can avoid being forgetful is to stay rooted in God's Word. It's then and only then will we have clarity in times of confusion. But there's a warning here at the end of the passage. It's not so much aimed at the saints, even though we learn from it, but it's particularly important for those who do not yet know Christ. In the last four verses, verses 9 through 12, we're told, don't be deluded. Don't be deluded. Now we just saw Christ's victorious coming at the end of verse 8, but at the beginning of verse 9, we're told that that imposter antichrist, the, the cheap substitute known as the man of lawlessness, he too has a coming. Look at verse 9 and following. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan, with all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Make no mistake, the Antichrist is not Satan, but he is empowered by Satan. The Antichrist, the, the man of lawlessness, his appearance, his coming, it will appear to be miraculous. It will appear that he is sent by God, that he is the one the world is waiting on. But everything he does is fake. The man of lawlessness is empowered by that ancient serpent of old who lifted himself above God's law. And all the powers, all the signs, all the wonders that the man of sin does, they are false. They're deception. 
No wonder those who spread lies about the day of the Lord are busy deceiving believers because they're just following in the footsteps of their father, Satan. They're simply mimicking the deceiver who will come, the man of lawlessness. Here's the more tragic part. There are many who will follow him. There are many who will believe the power and the signs and the wonders are real. They will think that the man of lawlessness actually is sent by God. They will think that he is actually God's anointed one. And these people are already perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. There will be people in that day who have heard the truth, they've heard the gospel, but they refused to repent. They refused to be saved, and they are perishing. But the story gets worse. Look at verses 11 and 12. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. How fickle is the human heart? How deceitfully wicked it truly is. How many of you immediately recoiled at hearing God's Word read to you? God sends them a strong delusion. That can't be right, can it? How could God do that to those poor, innocent people? We immediately put God on trial and we toss out what the verse actually says. You see, there are no poor, innocent people. What did the book say? They had pleasure in unrighteousness. They refused to believe the truth. They refused to be saved. They saw the work of the Antichrist and they proclaimed that this was truly the work of God. These are not poor, innocent people. God righteously seals them in their unbelief, just like Pharaoh in Egypt. You remember over and over, Pharaoh hardened his heart until eventually God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And there will be people on that day who have refused to believe and refused to believe and refused to believe until God sends them a strong delusion and seals them in their unbelief. God is holy and just, and He can use even the deception of the Antichrist as an instrument of His perfect judgment. So, dear friend, if you're here today and you recognize that you are not in Christ, stop playing games. Just because we're not in the day of the Lord now doesn't mean that God is any less just today. He is no less holy today than He will be on that day. You have heard the gospel. You hear the call to repent. Turn from your sins and trust Christ today. Look not to the false signs of all who oppose Christ. Look to the purity and the beauty and the reality of Jesus Christ. Only Christ can save you. Look to Christ today. Ah, but dear saint, you have no need to fear the judgment of Christ. You're not striving and straining to save yourself. Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to His cross we cling. And by the glory of Christ's cross, His resurrection, we do not fear the day of the Lord. We do not fear the chaos and the confusion of this world. I assume that most of you did not wake up this morning afraid that you had missed the day of the Lord. I assume that most of you are not losing sleep over the identity of the man of lawlessness. But many of you woke up afraid of something, of chaos, of confusion. That's your life. That's your world. That's not just your world, that's your address. Many of you are stricken by fear, afraid about that test result that you're waiting to get back, fearful about finances, Worried about the outcome of an election. And when you get done worrying about one thing, you're afraid that you won't have something else to worry about when that one is done being worried about. Our world is marked by fear. Are you? Are you? You see, if Christ, 
with just the breath of his mouth, will bring to nothing the man of lawlessness, the Antichrist himself. What do you have to fear? No, dear saint, don't be afraid. Look to Christ today. May it be so. And let's pray. Our gracious God, we tremble before your word. Your justice and your righteousness and your splendor overwhelm the strongest among us. May we take refuge in you. May we truly know that the only thing that stands between us and your righteous judgment is Christ. And Father, we seek comfort and strength through your Son, Jesus Christ. May your Spirit, who now restrains the man of lawlessness, also restrain our every desire for sin. And may your Spirit continue to make us more like Jesus Christ. May your Spirit do His saving work by drawing people even now to your Son in repentance and faith. For your glory we pray, our Father. It's in the triune name of our God we pray. Amen. As we seek to stand firm with clarity in a world of confusion, our focus is not on the coming of the Antichrist. Our focus is on the coming of Christ. And so to remind ourselves of that, we're going to sing the final stanza of a hymn that we know very well, but may we sing it like we truly believe it. We're going to sing the last stanza and we'll repeat the refrain of the solid rock. Would you stand as we sing? Wonderful, and you may be seated. If you have questions about trusting Christ, don't leave here today without speaking to me further about salvation through Christ. I'll be right at the back door by, when this service is over. But we continue now to respond to God's Word, this time in giving back out of the many blessings that He has bestowed upon us. And so as our ushers come forward uh, for our morning tithes and offerings, would you prepare your heart to give back to the Lord? Doug Ponder, would you pray for us?
have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And if we believe that, let's commit a few things to him in prayer. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. O holy God, maker of heaven and earth, we bow our hearts before you now, interceding for the world around us. Father, you are omniscient. You see and you know all things. You're not confused about one detail of this earth or about the future. But infinite Father, we acknowledge that we are finite. We are overwhelmed by all the details available to us at a moment's notice about the horrible things happening all around the world. There are indeed wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes and famines, and, and you tell us not to be alarmed, but we struggle to not be alarmed. Prince of Peace, would you bring peace on our earth? Would you defeat the wars that we hear about each day? God of justice and freedom, would you spread your freedom and justice for all across this earth? May the day soon come when every dictator, every tyrant, every potentate shudders under the weight of their sins and bows before you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And may we not fear any of these things, but may we look to you and your coming, O Christ, our victorious King. We pray, Father, also for this city. We pray for our mayor and our city council members. Would you give them all the wisdom that they need to lead in a wise and just manner? We do pray for the prosperity of our city, but we also pray, Lord, for the prospering of the gospel in this city. Lord, would you give us a heart for our neighbors? Would you break our hearts for the spiritual condition of so many around us? There are many who have, have heard the gospel and have professed your name and have been active in church and have simply walked away. And they show no fruit of repentance today. They show a complete lack of interest in your ways. Holy Spirit, would you awaken their hearts to the truths they once heard? Would you stir up their hearts and their minds and draw them to repentance and true belief? Lord, we know that there are many here in Palmetto who have never heard the gospel. They're walking as the Thessalonians once walked, following lifeless idols instead of the living God. Christ, would you be magnified in this city? Would you send heaven-wrought revival, a revival marked by the pure preaching of your word and confession of sin, a, a revival marked not by gimmicks but by the work of the Spirit pointing people to Christ, to Christ being magnified among us? And Christ, we pray for our church which we know is ultimately your church. You are Lord of this church. You're ruler of this church. Christ, would you move among us once again? Would you awaken our slumbering souls? Would your word be received as what it really is, not the words of man, but the words of God? And may we take confidence that your word is at work among us. May we stand fast on your word, even as the world is shifting all around us. And when the culture questions the most basic elements of civilization, may we not run, quiver, or stammer. May we increase and abound in love for one another. Father, would you establish our hearts blameless in holiness. Give us a faith that works and a love that labors and a hope that endures. May we be imitators of you, O Christ. May we long for the day that you return from heaven, saving us from the wrath to come. Would you do all of these things and exceedingly more? For your glory we pray. Amen. As we prepare to go out into this week, we have many opportunities for fellowship, many opportunities to grow deeper in God's Word, and opportunities for service. So a few announcements this Tuesday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, our men's community Bible study will meet once again to continue our study in 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 7 this week. If you haven't joined us yet, men, boys, you are welcome to come. All are welcome and we will have a wonderful time studying God's Word. If you haven't already received it, men, whether through email or Wednesday night, there's a reading guide on the table out there for you. It's just uh, tools to help you uh, study God's Word as you prepare in advance for this Tuesday night. There's also the Scripture Journals if you have not had an uh, opportunity to pick up one of those and would like one. Men, they're out there on the table. This Wednesday night, uh, we will continue our book study of Praying the Bible. We had a wonderful time this last Wednesday night doing that. I know some of you wanted to be there and couldn't be there. That's okay. Just come join us this week. We'll be in chapters 3 through 4, and we'll continue to see how uh, we can revitalize our prayer life. Uh, we must all acknowledge that sometimes we think prayer is boring. Let's just be honest. 
Some of you are ready for me to be quiet a while ago so that we could just be done. It's okay. God knows it already. But we can have joy in our prayer life. We can have a reinvigorated prayer life. And so I trust that this book will help us as we do that. This Wednesday night we'll be studying uh, chapters 3 and 4 of Praying the Bible. And then we will actually pray the Bible. Okay? And the choir will rehearse at 7. Uh, this Saturday we will uh, distribute our food bags, our food bag ministry we do each month, uh, at 2 p.m. right out here in front of the chapel. But now for us to distribute those bags, you know that means that they have to be packed. And they will be packed this Thursday at 11? Yes. All right. This Thursday at 11 here in the Old Fellowship Hall, we will be packing the food bags. So make your plans. If you're able to help us pack the bags, there's always a joyful time in that. We'll be distributing those uh, this Saturday. And we're also, uh, as we started last month, we're trying to, to glean more information from people to see who would actually be willing for us to just come and visit with them from the church, to return a phone call from them. And uh, that's a lot of work. So if you're interested in doing that, if you would be willing to just make a phone call or to go with me to visit someone, let me know because this is a joyful work the Lord has given us here in our community. Now, next Sunday, not this Sunday, a few folks were confused. Next Sunday, we're having our regularly scheduled church conference. Now you say, Pastor, if it's regularly scheduled, why haven't you said anything? Because we've been a little busy with other matters of business, and I didn't want to cause confusion, okay? So now that we've had other voting and other conferences out of the way, this is our regularly scheduled quarterly conference. It'll be next Sunday. After the service, we'll have a fellowship meal and a, a wonderful time of reflecting on what the Lord is doing among us. Uh, we'll review all the things that we typically review. We'll welcome in new members into the church. It'll be a wonderful time of fellowship and rejoicing in the Lord at our church conference. Remember that each month... If you're a member, you receive uh, the monthly financial statement. If you don't receive it through email, you get it sent to you in the mail. If you don't get it either way and you are a member, let me know and we'll make sure that you get that information. But be on the lookout this week for the most recent financial statement, but also uh, members, prospective member testimonies. That's the thing we really get excited about. So be on the lookout, whether in email or in your physical mail, you'll be receiving those things this week so that you can review them and be prepared for our conference next Sunday. But as we go out, we do go with the blessing of the Lord, a benediction of the Lord. And as we go out into this world, we don't have to be afraid uh, because we know that Christ tells us He is coming soon. So hear this benediction from the book of Revelation. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. And go in peace.